I'm here to talk to you about evidence and the reasons of trust. I think this is a quite an important issue. I think it's quite important that we understand uh, who and whether to trust. And as part of that, we need to know what sorts of reasons would justify trust. Trusting is the kind of attitude that can be uh, more or less rational. And so there are reasons which can count for or against it. So I'd like to give um, a general account of the right sorts of reasons for trusting someone as, as I see it. Uh, the aim here is to try to give a non-revisionary sort of account. I want to try and uh, stick as closely as I can to the uh, more conventional views about reasons. Um, so practical and evidential reasons in particular. It's very important to know whether to trust someone and if so, uh, who we ought to be uh, trusting. It's also important to bear in mind that the reasons we might have for withholding trust are not necessarily about uh, the other person being malicious or deceitful. People can also be forgetful, they might be incompetent, they might have overcommitted and not be able to do what we want them to do. I'm going to try and encapsulate both practical and evidential reasons. These, uh, this is the standard distinction that tends to be made when people talk about the reasons of trust. What I want to do is make a more nuanced distinction though, uh, one which will rule in some of both kinds, some practical and some evidential reasons, and rule out some others. Um, in particular, I'm going to be basing this on the idea that trust is reliance on someone else to be trustworthy. Now, I'm not going to give a full theory of trust and trustworthiness. Uh, I will be talking about them, of course, but um, the main focus here is, uh, is on reasons of trust. So let's uh, get into it. There are two main views. Uh, the first is what I call evidentialism. This is the idea that the only kind of reason that counts in favor of trust is the evidence that the other person will do uh, what you're trusting them to do. The other is pragmatism. On this view, uh, evidence still counts, but there are also practical reasons for trusting someone. Um, so I want to say a little bit more about this because both sides agree that uh, evidence does carry some weight. The disagreement is on the uh, practical reasons. So I just want to quickly run through uh, some motivations for thinking why practical reasons might count. So for instance, uh, we, if um, a friend is accused of something and they claim to be innocent, we're often more likely to uh, believe them, um, often beyond uh, where the um, evidence strictly would make it rational. And so for that reason, uh, it's, it's been suggested by Judith Baker, for instance, that trust is responsive to reasons other than evidence. Um, another point that needs to be considered is the uh, claim made by Karen Jones that trust and trustworthiness, part of the purpose of these concepts is that they will facilitate cooperation between people. And cooperation is about of course, working together for some sort of benefit. Um, because it aims at some sort of benefit, it's about practical as well as evidential reasons. And then there's the idea that trust can improve a relationship. You can uh, improve a friendship or develop a friendship, for instance, uh, by trusting someone in part. Note here that I'm here uh, making a very broad categories. By evidential reasons, I mean any reason which bears on the truth of the matter. Practical reasons, these will include moral reasons and reasons of friendship, uh, reasons for trust which um, don't necessarily bear on the truth of whether the person uh, will actually do what you're trusting them to do. Now, each of these kinds of reasons is associated with a certain problem when we consider it in the context of trust. So I want to look first at the problem with evidence. The issue is that too much evidence does seem to preclude trust. Now, this is quite odd, um, but consider um, if somebody 
tells you something or someone says they're going to do something, and you already have plenty of independent evidence that they're going to do that thing. There's no need for you to take their word for it, but you do believe it on the evidence. This doesn't seem to be a case of trust. Um, and so having too much evidence, in a sense, crowds out the space that there is for trust and replaces it just with um, an ordinary rational belief. In the background here, um, a couple of um, ideas have been suggested. Uh, the general idea seems to be that there is something distinctive in the character of trust that distinguishes it from ordinary beliefs. Um, so Hieronymy, uh, for instance, talks of not, tr not treating people as a reliable thermometer. You don't just uh, take what they say and add it to the evidence that you have. If you are trusting them, you are treating them as a person and you, uh, in a sense, uh, take them, you consider their agency when you are uh, taking them at their word. Marusik uh, also uh, takes a similar view. Um, he highlights the need for some sort of interpersonal relation in trust, which uh, evidence doesn't seem to allow for. He draws a distinction between telling someone that something is the case and just presenting them with evidence. The former case seems to allow for trust in the way that the latter does not. It allows for the scope of simply taking someone at their word. As I mentioned before, uh, both pragmatists and evidentialists do take uh, evidence to carry weight, so both need to answer this, but of course it does seem to be more of a problem for evidentialism. Okay, now the problem with practical reasons. Uh, so for this one, uh, we need to first draw a distinction between state-given and object-given reasons for attitudes. Now, a state-given reason is one that is concerned with the attitude itself. An object-given reason is one that focuses on the uh, content of the attitude. Now, a good example actually was, was given this morning um, by Professor Wieckfors um, when she talked about uh, believing things in order to um, protect our identity and in order to maintain our social standing. Uh, this would be an example of a state-given reason. It's not concerned with the truth of the matter. There's some benefit associated with adopting the belief. Another uh, example that you may be familiar with is Kavka's toxin puzzle. In this thought experiment, you are um, offered a substantial monetary reward for forming the intention to drink a certain toxin at a certain point in time. Now, this toxin is something that's going to make you feel unwell but won't have any lasting effects. And the puzzle is, do you have uh, reasons for forming that intention? And the reason it's puzzling is because it's a state-given reason. It's uh, asking you just to form the intention. It's not a reason for actually that directly addresses um, the actual drinking of the toxin. Now, the, the standard view is that state-given reasons are just the wrong kinds of reasons. If you have a state-given reason for an attitude, then you're not well justified in having that attitude. There um, have been um, some who have argued that the practical reasons of trust are state-given and therefore are of the wrong kind. If you have a reason which shows um, taking an attitude of trust to be good or valuable, whether for the sake of a relationship or just generally because you think uh, it's good to have lots of trust in the world, this is a state-given reason. It doesn't talk about the content of the trust. And so it's of the wrong kind. And this. Um, leads some, such as Hieronymy, to suggest that only evidence can count when it comes to trust. That's the problem with practical reasons. Now, I don't mean to say, I don't mean to suggest that these are insurmountable issues. It's just uh, that these are problems that one will need to tackle in order to give uh, an account of the reasons of trust. As I said before, I'm going to try and keep to the conventional views about reason. So that includes keeping trust distinct from other attitudes like belief, which are responsive uh, to evidence. I'm also going to uh, adopt the view that state-given reasons are indeed reasons of the wrong kind, and we need object-given reasons for trust. I'm also not going to take the view that there are special reasons of trust which are 
different from either evidential or practical reasons, um, as, as some have argued. Um, McMyler, for instance, talks about uh, passing the epistemic buck and saying, um, if someone tells you something and you trust them, the justification, you don't really need to justify yourself. You can just say, well, ask them. I'm adopting uh, what they said. Um, Marusik suggests that there are you know, reasons of trust which are not quite the same as either practical reasons or evidential reasons. Um, now, to summarize uh, so far, each kind of reason has a bit of a problem with evidence. Um, too much evidence seems to preclude the distinctiveness of trust. Um, as for practical reasons, they seem to be state-given and so of the wrong kind. So we're going to try and avoid both. Insofar as evidence counts, we're going to make sure that it's a sort of evidence that permits of the distinctiveness of the trusting attitude and doesn't give rise to um, an ordinary rational belief that the other person is going to do the thing in question. Insofar as practical reasons count, they need to be object given. Um, I mentioned uh, intentions with the toxin puzzle as well as beliefs. Uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind in that regard that uh, with in, when it comes to intentions, the object given reasons are practical reasons. For instance, if you were offered a reward to drink that you know, unpleasant but non-lethal toxin, there it would not be puzzling at all. You would just think, well, is it, is it worth it to, to drink it? Um, and that would, so that would be an object given uh, reason that's of a, a practical kind. So I'd like to introduce now the idea of trust as being reliance on trustworthiness. So there are two main parts here. Uh, the first is that I take, I'm going to take trust as an attitude of reliance. This is quite a popular view in the literature. And the reason I'm doing that is because reliance is, as an attitude can permit of both practical and evidential reasons. For example, if you were considering whether to uh, rely on a rope to bear your weight, suppose uh, you were looking to get down from a cliff face or something and there was a rope there and you wanted to climb down it, you would consider uh, both the evidence, how likely is it as far as you can tell that it's going to bear your weight, uh, but you would also consider your practical reasons. How important is it that you get down quickly, for example? Um, how beneficial would it be to you if it bore your weight? How detrimental would it be to you if it didn't? And you'd need a bit of both, probably, in order to get you on the road. As for trustworthiness, as I said, I'm not going to give a full account, but I'm going to adopt this idea of Hieronymus. Um, that it entails firstly being responsible, so if you're being trustworthy, then you are, you are doing something that you can be held responsible for. It involves being competent in the area in which you are being trusted, and it means uh, having goodwill to, to some extent to the, towards the person who trusts you. So this in very broad terms is what the uh, account gives us in terms of the reasons of trust. Um, it would allow some evidence and it would allow some practical reasons. In particular, it would allow for evidence that they are trustworthy because the trustworthiness is the content, not merely that they would uh, do the thing you're trusting them to do, but they, that they will be trustworthy. And similarly, practical reasons which show that it would be beneficial for them to be trustworthy, beneficial to you, uh, would, uh, would also count in favour of trusting them. So this uh, will get around both problems in theory. Uh, the evidence is of a particularly distinctive kind with trust. It's evidence specifically of trustworthiness, not just evidence that they're going to do the thing you're trusting them to do. And the practical reasons you'll notice are concerned with the content. They're concerned with the trustworthiness of the person, not with uh, the attitude of trust itself. Now, I'd like to just get into a little bit more detail and give some examples of good and bad reasons. So firstly, some good evidential reasons. Past experience with the other person would count because you would know, you would come to know whether or not they're trustworthy over time. Um, their reputation as well, if you don't have personal experience, you might have heard about 
uh, the kinds of things they do in similar cases. And failing that, you might look at the reputation of people who are in some way relevantly similar and in relevantly similar situations. Though, of course, at that point, we're moving a bit further away from the person themselves. And then um, there is the uh, suggestion that knowing that they have a practical reason to be trustworthy will give you evidence that they will be trustworthy. If you know it's going to be in their interests, that becomes an evidential reason in favor of trusting them. As for practical reasons, um, firstly, there's the importance of the task in question. If it's very important that this thing gets done, then uh, especially if you're not in a position to do it yourself, that's going to give you a reason to uh, trust someone else. But of course, that's always going to be balanced with how likely it is that they will actually do it. Relatedly, um, there is the question of whether that's the most efficient way of doing it, whether you could get it done some other way, perhaps by trusting somebody else. And again, related to that, there's the importance of knowing that you can trust a particular person rather than someone else. This might come into play if you have decided you're going to entrust a certain task to someone, but you're trying to decide who would be the most appropriate person. So some bad reasons. Um, for trust, at least uh, reasons which won't count in favor of trusting someone, but might uh, count in favor of uh, various other attitudes. Simply knowing their habits uh, wouldn't count, because that's not to do with trustworthiness. Another bad reason would be, uh, from the practical point of view, is trusting just for the sake of the relationship or for convenience, um, or so-called therapeutic trust to improve <laughs> the other's trustworthiness. We started with the observation that trust tends to uh, permit to some extent both evidence and practical reasons. There seems to be a bit of a problem with each, so uh, what I've tried to do here is only permit a restricted set. In particular, evidence needs to be of a kind that allows for the distinctiveness of trust and practical reasons need to be object given. I hope that uh, trust as reliance on trustworthiness uh, can non-arbitrarily impose these uh, restrictions. It can uh, make sense of of why they, um, they are there in the reasons of trust. With that in mind, we can see that both evidence and practical reasons can count, so long as the, they bear on the other person's trustworthiness and not just on whether or not they, uh, they perform, that is, do what they're trusted to do. Um, and I think this does allow for nuanced distinctions between reasons that are very similar. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.